Our classes followed water from cold, clear Ashland Creek to Bear Creek, learning all about the Bear Creek watershed. Then we went beyond our own watershed to the Rogue River. All along the way, we found conditions healthy for salmon and steelhead. The water stayed cold, loaded with oxygen, good pH, and clear enough for salmon to live. Macroinvertebrates indicated low pollution levels, and salinity testing showed no measurable salt. But where does the Rogue River go from here, and what happens to the water? The Rogue flows freely past the site of the old Savage Rapids Dam, a dam that was removed in 2009. You can still see some remnants of the old dam. From there, the Rogue River goes right through the middle of Grants Pass, making its way toward the coast. People come from all over the world to fish for salmon and steelhead in these waters. Downstream from Grants Pass, the Rogue cuts through the coast mountains, washing through steep but green canyons. This part is known as the Wild and Scenic section. Rafters seek out the river's challenging rapids. You might see a bear in this section, or smaller animals like deer and river otters. There's still a cabin here that was lived in by Zane Gray, a famous writer of westerns who stayed here to fish. Mule Creek Canyon is about as wild as a river gets. It takes great skill to get a raft safely through these waters. Even here, there's fresh water entering the river. If you prefer hiking, there's a trail that takes you all the way through. The scenery seems to never stop. Finally, the river becomes a small estuary at Gold Beach, where tides mix salt water into the fresh water. This is called an estuary. From here, the water from the Rogue River enters the ocean. Although our class isn't visiting the ocean as a group, there's a lot we can learn today about estuaries and ocean environments. We can learn about some of the animals that live in these coastal areas, the great brown pelican and the ever-present seagulls. We can learn about the world of the salmon as it begins its life in the Pacific Ocean, and we can meet some strange creatures that we would never see in our own watershed. We found an estuary that is easily accessible at Bandon, Oregon, where the Coquille River meets the Pacific Ocean much like the Rogue River does at Gold Beach. This is a larger estuary and one that's easy to observe. This is what it looks like when the tide is in at high tide. Water fills the river up to the high banks. This large harbor seal suns itself on one of the few boulders that's above the surrounding water. While the tide was still in, I collected a water sample to measure the salinity, the amount of salt in the water. On the Rogue River earlier, the salinity measured zero. We just took a sample from the mouth of the river uh, in the estuary and our salinity level is around 28. We have a salinity level of 28 here at the mouth of the river. I also took a water temperature level with a thermometer to compare with the Rogue River temperature levels that we'd taken earlier on the field trip. We also took a temperature reading here, and I was kind of surprised. The, the air temperature was 72 degrees, water temperature was 68, only four degrees uh, cooler. This was near the shore, but uh, that's, uh, as we say in the science world, it is what it is. It's uh, 68 degrees, uh, the temperature of the water, at least near the shore. Later that same day, I went out to this Pacific Ocean beach right near the mouth of the river to see if the salinity level was greater than that in the estuary.
stand here at the ocean, right at the ocean, on the beach, went into the water, took a sample, and we have 35. So we have a salinity of 35 where the Pacific Ocean comes into the beach. Let's talk about tides. When we arrived, the estuary was at high tide. There are two high tides and two low tides every day. In other words, every 24 hours. Take a look at this same view when the tide is out or low. Where there was only a boulder or two sticking up above the water before at high tide, now the whole wall of rocks can be seen. This rising and ebbing of the tides is what makes an estuary work. It creates a place where a great deal of ocean life can have its beginning and to grow to maturity. It has water that's salty, but not as salty as the ocean. Much of the basis for the ocean food web begins in estuaries. They're also where salmon change from a freshwater fish to a saltwater fish, a process called smolting. Estuaries are not the only coastal feature that provides for the ocean. Tide pools supply shelter and food for a great number of ocean animals. This tide pool is located on the central Oregon coast near Charleston. It's covered with water during the high tide but here the tide is low. We were able to explore the life we found there. Oh, there's some anemones right here. This looks like a little plant, but it's not. It's a sea anemone. And these little tentacles are there for catching food. They close up when they're out of the water. This is a sea urchin. That's a skeleton, right? The skeleton, the shell underneath, so all the spines would come out. And it's intact, which is, you know, it's like finding a, I don't know how rare it is. It's rare for me, personally. <laughs> this sea star is called a blood star for its color. So that's it. Did blood sea star. Remains? Is that what you were saying? Yeah, so... So it's really cool on these animals to do like comparative anatomy and physiology. It's okay to pick these up as long as they're returned. There's an abundance of sea snails at this tide pool. We found other mollusks among the sea snails. For a mollusk, you're looking for something with a soft, squishy body and a hard shell outside. Uh -huh. And here's an octopus. It's called sea sac, halosacion. Right. Um, these little bulbs uh, actually trap gas, mm -hmm. and it allows the sea sac to uh, be able to elevate in the water column and photosynthesize a little more effectively. And then this is feather boa kelp or Egregia oh, wow. menziesii. Ah, huh, menziesii. Menziesii, menzies. Yeah, named after the Soon famous botanist. Um, same as, right, right. Um, so this midrib is very identifiable for this species and then with uh, the blades working off the midrib like that. So that's pretty common. And then here's that. So there's the hold fast. That would be mm. And you can really see how a hold fast is a necessary part of most kelp out here. Um, yeah, think about this at a very high energy winter environment where you've got 15 foot rollers coming across this and breaking. Um, but very well oxygenated water. So, so do you want to see this octopus? All right. Looks like we found part of a jellyfish here. It's solid. It's solid, so that leads me to believe that it's a tuna fork. It could be. It could be a part of Aquaria too. Yeah. Well, I don't know. It was. It was more full. But this guy was. All right. Oh. Is that a sun? Pick the podia. 
it's in these games. Here we see a sunflower sea star in the process of eating a sea urchin. I heard one of those up from 200 feet. Now what is that? Is that right? It's called Pycnopodia. Pycnopodia, it's a type of starfish? So that's, yeah, that's a it's sunflower a sunflower star. star. Oh. oh, okay. Right here. We have a Pycnopodia. So it's eating that urchin right now? Yep, so that's what it does is it goes over, or starfish, what they do in general is they'll go over their prey right. and they extrude their stomach. Right. And it's really, really cool process. So it yeah. stomachs so inside yeah, you the... See the food, it's in the middle, taking all the stuff out of the urchin. Yeah. It's just the shell, the outside oh, I shell. I don't know why they call it a test. So that was a living urchin this morning, about huh. the time the sun went up. Mm -hmm. huh? Put it get away fast enough. And that's that's a really cool tide pull activity I was just telling him. We're aliens. But kelp crab have the same type of um so decorators crabs have these little um like velcro kind of things on top if you look at them under a microscope. This large mollusk is called a chitin. They are commonly found in Oregon tide pools. This mollusk is called a limpid. This is the underside of a sea snail. You can see its red foot tucked inside the shell. It's a broken back shrimp. This coastal creature and those related to it are found along the Oregon coast. Other species of broken back shrimp live in many different areas of the world. Here's a dense colony of sea anemones. They'll release their green tentacles when the tide comes in. The increasing tide prompted us to leave this tide pool, excited about the strange coastal life we found here. We weren't finished exploring the coast, though. On another day, we visited this breathtaking beach. This was the first sunny day in months along this part of the coast. Surfers came out to enjoy the sunshine and ride the waves. We enjoyed the sun as well. But we also did science, taking inventory of plots made on the rack line. A rack line is where the sea has left objects from when it was high tide. Griffin Creek students in fourth grade would have no trouble doing plot inventories here. Take a look and note the objects you see here on the beach on this rack line. When you get to visit the coast, we hope you'll take the time to explore, whether it's digging clams in the mudflat or watching sea lions at the edge of the ocean. There's a lot to learn about Oregon's coastal environment. We hope you'll also take good care of our own watershed. What we do here affects this vibrant environment on the coast. Be sure to recycle plastic so it doesn't end up in the ocean. Remember that the same water that runs through our watershed also becomes part of our rivers, estuaries, and oceans. You can protect these coastal areas by protecting our own watershed.